I, I want to begin by saying that Franz Fanon was not much older than you. Um, when he wrote his first book, which was called uh, Black Skin, White Masks, he was, I think, about 25. Um, so that's not much older than you. And he wrote that book based on his student experience. So that's why I just find it funny when um, we, our students can't write about their experience or their analysis of what is happening in the classroom or in the university. Um, oh, I, I remember that, uh, I, and this was mentioned by Dr. Murunga, uh, Fanon uh, grew up in Martinique. I urge you to get a, um, an atlas or a map to find out where it is. It's an island in the Caribbean which was uh, colonized by the French and they brought Africans as, as uh, enslaved labor to work there. So, uh, of course, by the time Fanon is born, um, the slavery has ended, but they still a very racialized uh, social class system. And uh, he grows up under a teacher called Aimé Césaire, who we will talk about later when we are talking about negritude. Uh, Aimé Césaire uh, was, as I mentioned in the podcast, uh, he was a teacher who said that despite us uh, Martinicans being uh, here for 300 years away from Africa, we are still Africans. And that's what the Negritude movement was about. It was about an assertion of being African. Um, so Fanon uh, is taught by this, uh, by Aimé Césaire, and then later on he goes to France to, to study to be a psychiatrist. And when he's there, he, he, he's able to detect the, the psychological and social problems that are caused by racism. And then one of the things that completely disturbed him, and this is where I'm urging you as young people, to think about society because you're at university, you shouldn't still be asking for when are we going to get jobs. So Fanon was a student doing all this curriculum and he was saying this curriculum doesn't match what I am seeing. And the explanations given by the French and European psychologists and psychiatrists of what are the problems for Africans and, and even Europeans in the racial um, order, their diagnosis is not correct. And so in, in, uh, in um, Black Skin, White Masks, which is his first book, as a young man, he starts to, to challenge what the scholars are teaching them about the, the human condition, especially in the colonial era. So really, we are talking about someone who was your age saying that what we are learning in the curriculum doesn't match what the reality is. And for us to understand and to build a knowledge that is relevant, we have to understand the experience of people. So in fact, even there's a section in the book called the lived experience, because he's saying the fact that European scholars are not capturing what we are going through is something that we need to challenge. And we challenge it through historical circumstances and human experience. So in, the, in uh, Black Skin, White Mask, which is the first book, he talks about how different people are affected by racism. He talks about the black woman, the black man, and the white woman. I can't remember, I haven't read it in a while, so I can't remember whether um, he also talks about the white man. But in each of, of, of the chapters, he looks at what are psychologists saying about the African condition? And then he says, these people are, are joking because they're coming up with these theories, talking of theories. They're coming up with theories that have no, um, have no recognition of the actual life of Africans and of the actual historical circumstances. So for example, you have, uh, there's, a, there's a guy called Manoni, who said that Africans are colonized because they have a psychology that predisposes them to, to colonization. And, and Fanon said that's ridiculous. Remember, I'm talking about a 25-year-old undergraduate student. I'm not talking about a 50-year-old big shot with big names and big titles. I'm talking about someone like you who says, no, what we are learning is not correct. 
So that's where that those are his roots. He came from a a, a, a background of questioning what they were being told about themselves. He questioned uh, because of a messenger. He questioned the fact that Africans are discriminated against and all the all, all the the stereotypes about Africans. When he went to France, he questioned um, what is this curriculum that we are being taught, and then. Uh, now, after he finishes his degree, he's sent, because he's a French citizen, Martinique is still um, sort of like a district, they call it a department of France. So when he's being sent to Algeria, he's being sent as a French national. Um, so, um, Algeria was the Kenya of France, what you call a settler colony meaning that the people who come the europeans who are coming to that colony are expecting to stay there as as citizens of the what they call the mother country so like the british when the british who are here who settled here they considered themselves british citizens not kenyans and they expected all the rights that british british citizens enjoyed in britain they expected to enjoy them here so for them they were not coming to start a new country they were start, they were coming to be british and to make kenya part of britain so that's the same thing with algeria in fact algeria was called french algeria meaning that it wasn't a colony the way uh, senegal was a colony the way um, cameroon or, or congo brazzaville it wasn't a colony it was an extension of france so the European settlers in France expected to stay and they expected to be treated as Frenchmen. So when the Algerians start fighting for independence, which is, is similar to the way somebody needs to mute their mic. Um, so when, when, uh, when when the algerian war broke out which was uh, dr murunga mentioned was mainly an urban war but it was basically the same thing of people refusing to be part of a country that discriminates against them on their own soil when that war broke out fanon was sent as a french national to go to the mental mental hospital and and um to the to the mental hospital where he 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 was supposed to treat people who were traumatized by the algerian uh, war of independence so there were many people who were part of who who were traumatized both the french nationals and the algerians and the french had developed such systems of torture and brutality that of course the algerians who were being brought to the hospital were traumatized so um the the what is it called sorry just give me a second yeah so so the the of anon as a young doctor was looking at this and saying this is ridiculous i am not treating uh, natural ailments that come from a normal society i'm treating trauma from a colonial situation which is already unjust so he wrote a resignation letter he said i can't uh, keep on being a doctor and pretend that there's nothing wrong with this situation and then he joined the he joined the other side he joined the the fln the the, the national liberation front of of, of the algerians uh, so he became an ambassador and uh, went, represented Algeria in different international forums. And then um, he started to notice, which is now where the wretched of the earth comes in. He started to notice that there are some assumptions uh, 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 countries which are becoming independent are making, which will end up being a problem after independence. And that is where he even mentioned the experience of Kenya and the fact that many Kenyan so-called nationalists before the 1960s were condemning the Mau Mau, but actually later on, 
uh, sort of pretending that they embraced the Mau Mau, but immediately independence came, the story changed. So he, he foresaw those problems because he was involved with, with many African countries. And then he, he started writing The Wretched of the Earth, which was his last book. And as he was writing, either before or just as he was writing, he was diagnosed with leukemia. And so when he's writing, and, and maybe that could explain the way what I was saying about the syntax of the book, he's desperate to finish before, uh, before the cancer wins. And, and uh, in fact, the, the, the book was published after he died. And the book became such an international, I don't want to call it best settler, but it became an, a book that was used by many uh, freedom fighting uh, movements around the world. Many people used uh, his analysis of the colonial situation to understand what was happening. And, and in fact, he was not even explaining what colonialism is. He was explaining the process of decolonization, the many interests that would be trying to fight for their own things. Um, and what, what would be good for the people? That's what the, the book was about. Um, so my first challenge to you is that this was a man who was not much older than you, who decided that uh, I can't just keep watching and say, repeating what Mualimu says in class. Um, what, what they are teaching us doesn't coincide with what we are seeing and what our lived experience is. And he, he, he took the initiative to say that um, this, this um, that uh, my knowledge will be useful for the freedom struggle, for what people are going through. So that's my challenge to you. I really get distressed to see Kenyan students just wanting to repeat what the lecturer says and ask for jobs which are not there. I mean, and being so passive and yet the, much of the intellectual work we talk about today was produced by people around your age. When you talk about Steve Biko, you talk about uh, Franz Fanon, uh, Amilka Cabral was a bit older, but younger people saying that I have to analyze what I'm going through and then putting it in work. That's what, for me, I get surprised when, when students don't do that. And when they just ask me, should I do this? Should I do this? Should I do this? That's not a language I understand. Maybe I will in the next 10 years, but I still have not understood it. All right. So um, the other thing now coming to national culture, because culture is such a, a place where we, we are contesting all the time, especially in this Kenya, because a lot of times some very strange things are done in the name of culture. So, for example, um, you have the 19, 1969 O thing, um, or just the other day, Peter Kenneth was made a cultural ambassador. I don't know what that means. Um, so culture is, is such a contested area that requires a discussion. Um, and that's why we are doing uh, this, this, that's why we are studying Fanon today. Okay, uh, there, there, there are a few things I want to mention um, that I think are important for us to know. Um, there, are, there are two things that are very important in understanding culture. One is power, power, and the other one is institutions. Because uh, I think one of the things we have a weakness in doing when we are talking about culture is also talking about how do we interact with power and institutions. And power, the definition I'm, I'm giving of power, which I borrowed from somebody else, is power is the ability to affect things beyond oneself. Or being able to do something that affects something else. Okay, so... Um, I'm not talking, uh, so uh, for example, let me say this. If I am working, if I am working and I'm doing this, reading all this stuff that I read, to have power is to be able to share what I'm reading with other people and people saying, um, yeah, oh, I hadn't thought of that. That is power. The, uh, power is the ability to, for example, to work 
and and be able to use that work to affect the life of your child meaning you get a salary to pay her fees or to take her to hospital or to just feed or you're able to grow food to feed your child that's power because you're able to affect you're able to use what you're doing to affect someone beyond you but to be a slave is to be completely powerless and this is what now if if i teach for 12 you if you you'll be my for 12 class that's what i'm going to talk about to be a slave is to be powerless is to have no impact on anything including your own self um so to be a slave for example is if you work and you have no say over what happens to your work and it affects nobody okay it's somebody else who decides what to do with the fruit of your work and who will be affected by your work that is now a slave a slave uh, an enslaved person is a person who for example if you look at what was happening in the americas they couldn't even have children and raise them they couldn't get married they couldn't choose who to marry that is to be a slave because you have no you have no way of implementing your own ideas okay and then autocracy which is at the other end is where you take absolute power and you determine what people what people can do and not do so the autocrat is the person who says no you can't marry so and so no you can't have children this way no you can't be educated this way no even if you if you work the the fruit of your work will me who will decide what to do with it that's now dictatorship so there's the power is the ability to have influence in society and i don't mean socialite influence or that kind of influence it's concrete influence over destinies and decisions that people make now the balance in that kind of power is when uh, people discuss and they talk and they say what do we want to do and we listen to each other and we act together that's where the balance is because you're saying uh, i can do this but i also want to do it with others okay so that's the ideal power and that is culture actually culture is where people exercise power as as individuals and as community together okay that's my definition but i'll i'll tell you how fanon inspires me to think that way so i've talked about power the other thing is institutions institutions are defined in the dictionary as an organization formed for a specific purpose so this this purpose can be religious legal professional or what, social economic whatever so what is happening in the kenyan state and in other states in the world is that there's a struggle over on for power between institutions which are organizations involved and institutions include the state so the state the state exercises power through institutions so you can have ministries government judges all those things that's how the state exercises power that's how it influences how we work shall we pay taxes which roads shall we go on you know which school shall we go to the institutions decide that so there's a struggle between institutional power which is exercised by the state using violence and there's power of the people which is culture so culture is where people take the power to decide what they want to do how will we educate how will we marry what kind of food will we eat and how will we cook it how will we use land those are that is where people together come together through their histories and and rituals and all those things and make decisions about their lives so we have a a, a struggle between institutional power which is exercised by the state and using a lot of violence to force their way and then this cult culture which is power of the people and that is why it's very significant that the 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 constitution includes a chapter on culture because if you're going to say that people are sovereign which is what our constitution says then culture has to be the way in which people exercise their sovereignty so uh, th that's one thing i wanted to say about culture people people power which is culture institutional power which is the state and the tension between the two 
And I'll tell you why I'm, this is important for me. Then the second thing I wanted to say is that colonialism is a paradox. It is attention, be, attention meaning, you know, it swings one way and the other way all the time, which is very confusing. Um, there's a tension between absolute negation of African cultures and their, and their, what do you call, encouraging them. Let me just say it that way. And the reason why I'm saying this is because there's a Kenyan line which has started to irritate me, where people say the white man stole our culture. He can't. He can't steal it. He can't completely steal it because culture is people. As long as we are there, we have this culture. What we are talking about is a paradox because the, the, or a contradiction. The Europeans did not want the complete elimination of African culture. Because if there's a complete alienation, uh, elimination of African culture, see now we'll become like Wazungu. And then we, if we become like Wazungu, we start competing with them. They, so they don't want us to completely abandon African culture. It's not even possible. But that's not what they wanted. They wanted African culture to always be subordinate, to be in a lower position, and that our cultures would never grow without approval of the state. That's important. It's a ceiling, basically. It's like if you grow a seedling, and as it grows, you say, no, it has to stop here. It cannot grow beyond here. That's what colonialism was. It wasn't the complete elimination of African culture. It was saying your cultures can only grow up to a certain point. And not only that, it's us who decide what that point is. So it's a, it's a, it's a contradiction. You know, because cultures organically grow. It's like if you have a baby and the baby is growing, you know, growing, growing, growing. When they, you, then you say, no, you're only going to reach one meter. But the biology will not hear that. The more you feed the child, the child will keep growing. So you can't stop the child growing, but you can use violence to make sure that the child does not grow beyond a certain place. So as a child grows taller, then they would have to bend their head so that they can, so that they can keep growing, but they are not, they, they, they are not, they can, they'll keep growing, but now they'll grow this way instead of keeping on growing up. That's what Europeans wanted with culture, African cultures. They didn't want to eliminate them. They wanted to stifle them and to dictate how far cultures can go or not. I think it's very important to understand this because this story of our kids have no culture is nonsense. Culture survives because culture is organic to humanity. What the problem is, is the way the state makes sure that certain cultural expressions do not grow, that they have to bend to the state. And that's, that's the thing that we need to understand. And, and for example, I'll, I'll give the example of pastoralists. Right now, uh, the, the World Bank, the World Economic Forum are trying to uh, stop pat pastoralists from moving from place to place with their cattle. And, and, and what is the excuse they are giving? They are saying, yeah, this is a very good culture, but it's not good for the environment. Basically, they are saying this culture cannot grow beyond what we want. And what do we want? We want people to just uh, stay in one place and farm there and take care of their cattle there like English, the way English people have their jerseys, uh, those big cows staying in one place. Basically, that's what they are saying. But of course, they are not going to say it that way. They are saying stay with your shukas and your necklaces and whatever, but you can't uh, move. You can't move and make an economic living out of that movement. So that's what European, in fact, they are saying, please stay with the dances so that when European tourists come, they can come and enjoy you people jumping around. So what, what they are saying is not, we want an elimination of the culture. They are saying, we want the culture to stay, but according to our terms. Our terms are tourism, dollars, and you know exclusive places for azungu to come and relax if your culture fits within those parameters we'll allow it but if it goes beyond that to people saying 
it's our right to graze, it's our right to move from place to place in search of pasture, now that becomes a problem. So we need to understand this paradox and I'll, I'll explain later why this is a very important point. It's a paradox. It's not complete elimination, it's stifling, making sure that something grows only within the confines that are given by the European state. And then the next point I want to make, which I've already made, is that as long as there are people, this, there is culture. Culture is like human dignity. You can't ban it. Uh, so instead of saying our culture has disappeared, people need to ask, what are the things preventing our culture from growing? That's the real question. It's not whether our culture has gone. It's what, what is preventing our culture from growing? What is preventing our culture from, uh, from addressing the problems that we have? Why do we have to always say Serekali to Saidiye when we have cultural norms that can deal with the problems that we are facing? That's the real question. Um, and then I've said culture is dynamic, is dignity, it is also dynamic. And now in, in uh, Fanon's book, this is what he says. He says, a national culture is the whole body of efforts made by a people. So it's people together, made by a people in the sphere of thought, meaning what do we collectively think about something? It is a, a, a whole body of efforts made by a people in a sphere of thought to describe to justify and to praise action through which a, the people has created itself and keeps itself in existence. What that means is culture is how all of us together as people come together and decide what is good, that is what he means by justifying, what are we doing, that is describing, and praising, saying this, this we value. Okay, so describing, we are saying what we are doing. Justifying is saying we are doing it because A, B, C, D. And praising is saying this is what we value. Okay, so culture is the process by which we do that. We, by which we describe our actions, we justify them, and we praise them. Together. And we are saying that we are praising these actions because this is how we survive as a people. You cannot survive as a people unless you're deciding what actions are good and which actions you shall praise. And that is where right now Kenya is contesting. We are being told our heroes are these and Kenyans want heroes that describe their own actions that justify what we do and praise the action that we do. And because we need to do this so that we can survive. We cannot survive unless we are doing this. So all those stories of, you know, are you a real this or are you a real that, that's not what culture is. Culture is about a process of living together and making decisions and deciding what, is, what we are doing, uh, why we are doing it, and what do we value. It's actually that simple. Well, but it's also very complicated. All right. Um, so there's a book which is quite, there's a chapter in the Richard of the Earth that is quite famous where Fanon now uh, looks at national culture and what were the challenges that countries that were becoming independent how would they have to deal with the cultural question and um, there were two tensions the same tensions we still have today there was the idea that culture is praising the past and the traditions that everybody used to practice before colonialism happened. And then there was the side that Fanon was taking and saying, no, culture is dynamic. It's not just going to the past. It's also going to the past to, in a way that affects the present. And that gives people the ability to describe, justify, and praise what they are doing. Um, so uh, what, what he was doing in this chapter was to say that uh, African intellectuals and cultural people need to uh, take a step back and think, where are we, what has happened to us, and what do we need to do about it? So he starts by saying that colonialism seeks to destroy a people's past, 
uh, to convince them that they are nothing without the colonialist who protects the Africans from themselves. So remember what I said about the ceiling. So the colonialists are, are, are there to convince you, oh, if I talk about Mekatilili, I'm not supposed to talk about her, you know, because she's irrelevant. In fact, that's what they say. She's irrelevant to, did Mekatilili drive a car? Did she have, have a cell phone? Then how is she relevant? And that's the nonsense we are told all the time. Why are you going back to that? And yet there were no cars that time and there were no whatever. Okay, so colonialism seeks to disconnect us from our past by not teaching it, and that's why it's not taught in the schools, so that we can never refer back to it when we are making decisions about today or about tomorrow. And it does this by convincing us that uh, we cannot do anything without the colonialists approving it. So these days, of course, nobody is going to say that, but we have the terms for that kind of thinking. We are told benchmarking. Siju, have we benchmarked? Have we looked at best practices? Uh, there are a lot of times I hear government saying we have to be international, we have to meet international standards. It's the same story. It's a story of we can't go anywhere without approval from the West. Um, and then he also says, he, he clarifies, he's saying, I am not condemning uh, the, 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 the retrieval of past traditions. He's not saying never go back to the past. What he's saying is that if you stick at just going to the past and never uh, uh, using it to inspire action in the present, then you are going to reach a dead end. You're not going to go anywhere. Um, because that tradition is disconnected from the reality. So even if you go back to the past, you have to go back to the past because you want to inspire the present. Please note, I didn't say apply. I'm not saying apply. That's a very commercial kind of idea. I'm saying inspire or inform, meaning that you're taking a new decision, but it is inspired by the past. It is informed by the past. And then uh, he also, um, he, he now also talks about are African intellectuals capable of doing what I am saying? And he says, uh, actually, it's actually a very complicated situation because many of these intellectuals have been educated in the Western system. So uh, he's, he talks now about, so he says that if African intellectuals want to influence their national culture, they have to go through three stages, not to go through three stages, but well, he says that um, normally before an, a Western educated African is able to meaningfully contribute to their culture, they go through three stages. And the first stage is that first the intellectual is ashamed. So because he's going to school, he's being told about God save the queen, he's being told about European civilization and, and being told African civilization does not compare the intellectual is ashamed. They come out of the school system ashamed and feeling that Africans are backward and they must always ask for opinions from the West or seek direction from the West. But then after a while, and especially when people start struggling for against colonialism, the intellectual realizes, I have nothing to be ashamed of. Even me, I come from a culture to be proud of. So the second stage is that the intellectual now goes back to the culture, what I was saying. They look for all the traditions, saying this is how our people did, this is what people did. And more than that, they do that to show the white people that, look, even us, we had a culture. So he's saying that it is a it's kind of like a, an, an inevitable step. If you are to become, it, when people eventually become uh, nationalists fighting for their people through culture. They go through that stage of uh, trying to prove, get uh, nice things in African culture to prove that we were also civilized so that the white people can recognize that we were civilized. But you see, it's still looking for recognition from, from the colonialists. It's not yet a self-recognition. 
so the, the, the intellectual goes through the archives and looks for things and then now presents to white people and say, hey, look, even us, we were civilized like you. And we still do that till today, which I find quite irritating. Uh, like, for example, when, when we were called a shithole by, by uh, Trump, um, I saw Kenyans, which was so disturbing. I saw some Kenyans getting pictures of magical Kenya and saying, oh, if Trump only saw uh, magical Kenya, he would change his mind about uh, Africa being a shithole. But you see that the point is still that you want his recognition for you not to believe you're a shithole. So you're still legitimizing uh, Western culture. So, but that is a stage people go through in their cultural renaissance or rebirth. And then the third stage is where, uh, after especially people uh, in, in the Mashinani have decided this is untenable, we can't stand this, we are fighting back. Even the intellectual realizes, there's no point of me always telling people about what we used to do, what we used to do, what we used to do. I have to also fight back. And how do I fight back using the tools of my knowledge? And, and this is where he says that if any intellectual who has not gone through that third stage of connecting their knowledge to the real struggles day to day, vitu kwa ground, unless an intellectual talks about those or connects to those, then they are just wasting their time calling themselves cultural. Any culture that does not talk about what people are doing is not culture, it's tradition. And then he says that a nation is proved not by culture, but by struggle. And that's important because culture is the tool of struggle, as, as uh, Dr. Dr. Murunga was saying. Culture is the tool of struggle. It is culture that decides what we are struggling over, how we are going to do that struggle. And then remember, it will describe our struggle it will uh, justify that struggle and it will praise that struggle. So culture is a tool, it's not a goal. It's a tool of the struggle and culture is made by struggle. So for example, um, you know, I'll, I'll use the culture that I know. Uh, among the Kikuyu, it was considered a curse to see a, for a man to see a woman of his age uh, naked. And, and, and that, yeah, it was considered a curse. That, that expression before colonialism was different from the expression in the 1990s when women who were protesting for the release of their sons from illegal detention did the same thing, um, sort of stripped when the police came, okay? That's an affirmation of culture because they are using a cultural idea to fight in the present. And this is what politicians don't want when they go for anointing and endorsement from elders. They don't want a culture that will enable us to struggle. They want a culture that will enable, will, will keep us down, just the way the colonial state did. That's what politicians do. The cultural expressions they want are for us not to demand anything. It's for us to just to leer and you know, do what, uh, the people who want to, to make money from us want. So, um, so I'm going to, to give a few uh, what Fanon said about the difference between mere culture, I mean culture and just tradition. Traditions are important for culture, but they are not everything about culture. So Culture, he says, is, is tra uh, translucent. You can see through it. It explains itself. But tradition is opaque. It means you can't see anything beyond that tradition. And what we as students of culture and literature are going to do is to see through culture. We are not going to see just culture and stop there. We're going to see life through it. Um, and then culture is not simplistic. Culture eludes or avoids simplification. So there's, there's a tension, there's a complication, but with tradition, it's very simplistic. So for example, one of the articles, first journal articles I wrote was about polygamy. 
And I was saying that the way we talk about polygamy is very simplistic. It's about tradition. And you see, especially men saying that uh, polygamy was a pillar of African society. That's a very simplistic way of looking at it. What I did was to say, it's actually more complicated than that. I talked about proverbs against that cautioned against polygamy. I talked about uh, epics and stories that cautioned against polygamy. I also talked about rituals that African women had for complaining about polygamy. So what I was saying is that culturally, it is more complicated than when you look at it as a tra tradition and you keep saying it was compulsory men had to do it. That, that's, that's nonsense. It was more complicated than that. And what happens a lot of times is that African intellectuals, especially those educated in the Western education system, we tend to oversimplify things because we are still at the second stage where we are trying to prove to white people that we are, we are civilized. Which Fanon is saying, just let go of that struggle. It's not worth it. Um, and then culture, another uh, distinction is that culture is about struggle and tradition is about status quo. So normally when people are talking about tradition, they are saying, let's keep the status quo. Let's not push things too far. Uh, he also says that culture is constantly transforming itself and tradition is static. It stays at the same place. Uh, culture is authentic, meaning it is an actual expression of what we really, really feel. But um, tradition tends to be, you know, people just say, okay, I'm doing it because somebody else said. And then culture is about truth and reality. Culture is what helps us deal with what we are going through, but tradition is normally about power. And that's what politicians reduce our ethnic cultures to. They reduce them to traditions because they want to maintain their power. So what does this mean for literature, since we are literature students and culture students? Uh, this is what I would say, but I want to hear what you think. Uh, we need to accept every cultural production by a Kenyan as Kenyan culture, because it explains an aspect of the Kenyan people. So sometimes, you know, you'll hear people saying, ah, what she's doing is so Western. I think for us as theory students and as students of culture, we need to say more about that. Not just say, oh, that is a Western expression, but to say, how did it come about that somebody is using Western standards to express themselves? You know, what does it say about class, about institutions, about power? because there's so many things to say about it. Um, then the other, thing, um, the other thing I would like to say that it means for literature is that we need to name the context and the values in which a cultural production thrives, okay? Calling something African or not African to me is ridiculous. If it has been produced by a Kenyan, then we, our role as scholars of culture is to explain where it came from and the values that it, it upholds. And you don't have to agree with those values. You don't have to agree with the expression, but it's your job to explain it. You're a theoretician. You're, you're doing theory. It's your job to explain it. So, for example, you know, when, when uh, the, the Kwani uh, literature, Kwani literature started in the 90s, uh, some lecturers called it literary gangsterism because the, 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 the people were writing in Sheng, they were using urban uh, culture and, and stories. And so these lecturers felt, ah, no, it doesn't sound like Goge Wathiongo or Chinua Achebe, so it's not African enough. No, it's African. Okay, what does it say about us? What does it say about urban life? What does it say about our national institutions? That's what students of literature ask. So we need to name the, the values and the context because what Fanon was saying is that culture is a living expression of the people. What, it's a description of what we do. It's our justification and it's our praising. So that's what you look for. What is this literature describing? What is it justifying? And what is it praising? 
that's what students of theory do. And then we need to uh, name power institutions and people in every cultural production. So what does that cultural production like novels, uh, movies, um, songs, what do those texts mean? What do they express about the people? So, and we need to look for, like I said, we look for institutions and we look for culture. Because sometimes even though people complain that, oh, our cultures are not this and not the other, it, the problem is an institutional problem. First of all, we, the, the education system bashes the humanities. So what do we expect, like really? If on one hand, everybody's saying that humanities, you can't get a job, it's not good for the economy. How, where do you expect the culture to come from? If people are not learning their history and their humanities because you're saying it has no market. So we have to name, we have to name how uh, 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 artists and the texts they produce, how do they interact with the institutions and with power? So for example, if you look at, uh, and I give this example, the song uh, Inchi Akitu Kidogo by Eric Kwainaina. When that, that song came out in the 90s, we were so excited because it was capturing the corruption we could see. But there was one time he tried to perform it at a national event and the government officials wanted to, to, to shut down the performance. But then the people insisted and he went ahead and performed. So it's not enough to just keep on saying this one is hmm, doesn't sound African enough without talking about what are the institutions that, and the context that we are dealing with in this story or in this song or in this performance. Um, and then the last thing I was saying, and this is what I think it means for literature, culture grows through struggle. We need to name the struggles, by the way. And unfortunately for me, I feel that people who go to the, the school system in Kenya, they are so bad at naming the struggles. They find it hard to say there's a tension between this and this, and this is why I'm going to think this way. This is why a song was produced this way. Instead, people want to explain, which is what I was telling you last week. People want to explain things. Um, you know, they want to explain a book, they want to talk about metaphors or whatever, but they don't want to talk about what is this cultural production saying about Kenya, about the things people are confronting, about the context in which we live. That's the role of you now as a theory uh, student. And when you go to teach, some of you are going to teach, that's what you will be doing for your, for your students. You'll be explaining the context, the tensions, the struggles, the, the, what is praised, what is justified, and what is described. That's what you will be doing with literature, not giving people a stick and saying there's no moral here, or there's no African culture here, or there's no white man suppressing our culture. There are so many uh, cliches that we use to talk about the arts, but now I think with Fanon, we can now put those cliches to rest and we can show our students and the rest of society that culture is actually very complicated and it is more than just about uh, identity. It's also about history, economics, philosophy, so many other things. It's about how we relate to the past and the present and the future. So I'm going to stop there. I, I, let me hear your comments before I have quite a number of interesting videos I want to I want to to show you. So are there any questions? And I'll stop the recording here.